Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure once again to welcome you to today's session on Medicaid. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties throughout today's session, please send us a tech support request via email to milfamln at gmail.com. We'll place this email address in the chat momentarily for your convenience. We do look forward to having you also join us in the chat pod today for conversation, for questions, as well as hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see the toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen and then from there select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to select everyone from the response option drop down menu so everyone is able to view those in the chat pod. We'll be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. We'd also like to note that event materials, including a copy of today's slides, are available on our event page. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. It's my pleasure now to turn things over to my colleague Rachel Browner. She's a program coordinator with the MFL uh, military caregiving team and she'll be introducing our presenter today. Rachel. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, you are muted, so most folks, I saw there's a few questions in the comment, um, in the chat box, excuse me, about muting, so you are muted. Um, but a way that we're going to be able to communicate is through this chat box. So if you can, at this time, if you haven't already done so, let us know where you're joining us from. It makes this platform a little bit more personable, um, and our way of communicating with you is going to be through that chat box. So let us know where you're joining us from. If there's more than one of you in your office, um, we'd like to know that as well. And then if you have any questions or comments for our team, our caregiving team, or the presenter, um, feel free to type that in the chat and we'll make sure that um, someone answers those questions or comments. Um, all right, so today's presenter is our very own Dr. Christopher Pline. Um, Dr. Pline is a professor of public administration and an Eberly family professor for outstanding public service at West Virginia University. His academic research is on health and social policy, and he's been published in such journals as Health Affairs, the Journal of Health and Human Services Administration, and the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Uninsured. His expertise on Medicaid and health policy has led to invited presentations at the state and national levels, presentations to the West Virginia legislature, and interviews with state and national media. Um, Dr. Pine is also part of this Military Family Learning Network military caregiving team. So we're very excited to have one of our team members um, talking about Medicaid um, services today. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass over the presenter reins to Dr. Pline. Rachel, thank you so very much. Uh, and thank you, Coral. And I also want to welcome our captioner, Sarah, who's going to be providing a closed caption for us today. Um, it is a really uh, a great opportunity for me, and I really appreciate it to be able to spend some time with all of you this morning. I know how busy all of our participants are taking time away from their work to sit in on a session, which I think is quite important. You know, just looking through the chat pod right now and seeing where folks are from, really from across our country, as well as uh, we have representation from Italy. I see a couple of familiar names. I certainly see places that I have visited and even some of the uh, installations that I've had the, uh, the uh, honor to be able to, to uh, visit. And um, it's, it's an important thing that we're gonna talk about today, I would say, and, and, and that is this, this notion of Medicaid. You know, most of us have an understanding that um, in the United States, Healthcare services are provided by many, many different um, players, stakeholders, actors, you use the phrase that you'd like. Um, but the federal government and state governments play an absolutely essential role in providing healthcare access and coverage for millions of Americans. Many of you who are in the uh, military uh, community know that our TRICARE and Defense Health Administration provide a uh, very important um, coverage and access benefits for our military families, and for our personnel. 
Um, but in many ways, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg where we know that programs such as Medicare, which we had a presentation on last month by uh, my colleague, Andy Crocker, and Medicaid uh, really are major features in the healthcare landscape. So what I would like to do today is I'd like to introduce and perhaps reintroduce the topic of Medicaid uh, for all of you and make some connections to the military um, world, if you will. Uh, Medicaid is in a time of transition. Uh, in fact, one of the constants of Medicaid is that it's always been a time of transition. It's a constantly evolving program, which has had significant influence on the way that we conceptualize and deliver healthcare in the United States. And so perhaps February is a good month to talk about the change in moral of Medicaid because we know February is a time of change itself, but the season is changing. And uh, so, if you will, let's go on this journey today. So there are four learning objectives for the day. Uh, the first is just to provide you all with a general overview of the Medicaid program and how it is relevant to military families and communities. Also, I'd like to provide to you some information on the Medicaid expansion. Uh, a lot of folks recognize that Medicaid has expanded uh, since around 2013, 2014, under new federal laws and provisions uh, associated with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, states have had the discretion, if you will, to increase eligibility for Medicaid, which has resulted in more families being able to be eligible and receive coverage under Medicaid. We're also gonna talk about uh, recent developments in Medicaid regarding waiver programs. A number of our military families are familiar with waiver programs because oftentimes they provide community-based and home-based services for those with disabilities and other care needs. And so a number of our military families um, make use of Medicaid through what are called waiver programs. And so we'll provide an update on that today and maybe give you some idea of where things might be heading. And on that, the last uh, topic that we want to focus on today is basically how Medicaid relates to addressing social determinants of health, and it's helping uh, this with the broader adoption of telehealth services and somewhat of a mission uh, evolution, if you will, within Medicaid, which is taking into account some of the foundational and systemic factors that, uh, that, that uh, influence our health status and our access to care. So, so fairly broad agenda, but I think we'll be able to get through it in the next 45 to 50 minutes. So a couple of very general observations to share with you. You know, one might think that Medicaid is apart from their, their lives or apart from the, the, the community or world in which they work. But Medicaid is quite relevant to the military and indeed to the entire healthcare system. So a couple of points to emphasize here. One is Medicaid shapes the broader healthcare landscape. You know, you'll see a slide here in just a moment, but approximately 20% of, uh, of, uh, of those in the United States receive their healthcare through Medicaid. Medicaid in many states is the first or second, usually the second uh, largest, largest payer for healthcare services uh, combined um, with Medicare, the program that we know is primarily for those who are older, uh, Medicare and Medicaid themselves really constitute a major source of payment for healthcare services across our country. You can imagine that with such a large market presence, if you will, that Medicaid really does help to shape the landscape of healthcare in terms of the way services are provided, the way uh, patient case management is conducted, uh, the way that, that the landscape itself is, is structured uh, to, uh, to deliver healthcare. Um, we have to realize that healthcare delivery systems are a reflection of those who pay for the care. And, and we know this. I mean, we see this with TRICARE, for example, for those of you who are in the TRICARE system, we know that TRICARE has been going through some changes uh, with perhaps greater emphasis on um, private uh private care, if you will, or private sector care, managed care arrangements. And so we know that those who pay for health care, such as Medicaid or Medicare, help to shape that landscape. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. But if you will, if Medicaid has a broad influence on the military uh, community in terms of shaping the overall uh, uh, health care landscape, 
It also may have a very specific impact on the military community. Uh, for example, in some circumstances, Medicaid coverage may supplement the TRICARE benefit. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, Medicaid and TRICARE are recognized as uh, recognize those who may be duly eligible. In other words, a family may be receiving the TRICARE benefit and also be eligible for Medicaid for some of its family members. Medicaid coverage may be especially important for older family members or after separation from the military. So even if Medicaid is not a part of your world right now or part of the world of those that you work with, it may become important to them as older family members perhaps become eligible for Medicaid or after separation from the military where families oftentimes, working families oftentimes find themselves connected to the Medicaid system. And finally, Medicaid is ever-changing and new developments may be in store. Uh, those of you who've been part of the Military Families Learning Network over time know that our um, military caregiving team has provided regular updates on Medicaid because this is a program that is so important and so ever-changing. So just a couple of uh, uh, big picture items. Medicaid was established in 1965. It was originally a safety net program uh, intended for folks who were, who were very poor. And um, so when it was originally developed, it was developed in, in um, it was developed in coordination with our Medicare program. And actually the architects of the law thought that Medicaid would be like a niche program serving those who were very, very poor. But what's happened over the course of now almost 60 years, 60 years in 2025, the program has expanded to provide health care coverage for low-income families and individuals, as well as those with disabilities. So Medicaid, if you will, has become this very important platform to extend and expand health care access uh, to American, uh, to, to families in, in need, uh, families who qualify with, with income status. And it now covers approximately 20% of our population. Now, the coverage, Medicaid coverage is, is especially important for those with special needs because oftentimes uh, services are, are provided to what are called home community-based service waivers or HCBS waivers, uh, which have become uh, a very uh, important component of, of, of healthcare provision and services over the last 35 years or so. And so what we may find is that families that uh, are eligible for um, or are receiving uh, uh, coverage under TRICARE, for example, or um, Medicare, or even other forms of insurance, uh, may find themselves relying upon Medicaid uh, to provide these essential services that may not otherwise be covered by their plans or their benefit packages. Now, the third point that I want to emphasize is that Medicaid is jointly funded by the federal and state governments. So this is perhaps one of the most important takeaways that I want to share with you. Now I'm looking across uh, our participants here and seeing people from all these different states in the United States, right? You know, North Carolina, California, Texas, Florida, West Virginia, Georgia, you name it. Okay, so think about where you are right now. Think about where you're sitting right now. Uh, in your office, at the installation, at, the, at home. And I want you to remember that the Medicaid program that is in the state that you are currently residing in is very distinct, and it will be different from other state programs. What's essential for us to remember is that Medicaid is funded in large part by the federal government. And the federal government provides a general framework for states to follow with their Medicaid programs. But the states themselves have wide discretion on how they structure those programs. Which means that a Medicaid program, say, in West Virginia, is not necessarily going to look the same in Virginia, nor between Virginia and Maryland, or between California and Nevada, you name it. Okay, there's a lot of state variation. And this creates at times a little bit of confusion. It may also create concern. And one of the things that we have recognized and that I'm sure many of you recognize working with military families is that this is a cause of concern at times for families who may need to move across state lines as part of the PCS process. 
And so if they're relying upon Medicaid in one state and they move to another state, there may be challenges involved in accessing services or even finding the same services that are provided. So it's a thing to, for us to keep in mind. Medicaid is funded by both the states and by the federal government. And basically it's a cost share or a match, a matching grant. And it varies from state to state. If we think about it, in some states, the match is about one to one. So for every dollar a state puts up, uh, the federal government puts up a dollar. In other states, it's a much more generous match. In the state that I live in, uh, pre-COVID, because there's a special match rate going on right now, the match rate was about um, $3, federal dollars, to every $1 the state put forward. All told, the states together fund about 38%, about 38% of the Medicaid program with the federal government uh, funding the balance of that, about 62%. So it is a shared state federal program, and it's a program that, um, that varies greatly across this, this quilt, patch, patchwork quilt, if you will, of states that we have in our country. So each state has their own distinct uh, characteristics with their Medicaid programs. And while there are similarities, most definitely, there are also very important differences for us to keep in mind. So, a little bit more detail about Medicaid. As mentioned earlier, it supplements health coverage benefits, including Medicare and TRICARE. And this is quite important um, because um, again, uh, with, with TRICARE, there may be circumstances where families would need to turn to Medicaid uh, for a wraparound uh, coverages or supplemental uh, support, especially if uh, families have specialized care needs. With Medicare, that, that, that partnership between Medicaid is very, very important, especially in terms of long-term care, where Medicaid might, may oftentimes help to provide support for long-term care, whether it's in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, a, uh, a uh, long-term care facility or whether it's at the home or a community. The other thing about Medicaid is that it oftentimes provides services not delivered in traditional medical settings, such as in-home care and some school-based services. So Medicaid has been utilized as a platform to extend and expand healthcare services outside of the walls, if you will, of the traditional healthcare facility. Here's something else that I would like to emphasize. Medicaid has been a trendsetter. It's been a trendsetter in the types of services covered and how they are delivered and coordinated. I'm a teacher, so if I were together with all of you right now in the classroom, I would probably ask you all to raise your hands and say, how many of you have heard of managed care? And I would anticipate that most folks would raise their hands and say, yes, I've heard of managed care. Well, managed care has been around for more than a few decades, but it really has been sparked and it really has gotten a lot of its uh, motivation, if you will, from Medicaid, because states utilize managed care for their Medicaid systems. And so a lot of what we know about managed care, a lot of how managed care has been shaped has been because states early on, many states early on adapt, adopted Medicaid managed care uh, to coordinate care and try to control costs. A lot of the um, emphasis that we see on prenatal and early childhood care have also been influenced by Medicaid. Most importantly, I would say is that Medicaid has really created a paradigm shift in the way we provide long-term care support and services, where increasingly Medicaid has provided and allowed for services to be delivered in the home and community-based settings rather than in institutional settings. And this may be one of the most influential aspects of Medicaid. As we'll talk about just a little bit later, Medicaid may be shaping the, the landscape again because Medicaid has been over the last, uh, oh gosh, two years now with the pandemic, Medicaid has been sort of a leader or a pioneer in helping to support uh, telehealth medicine. So Medicaid, uh, while oftentimes a source of controversy and debate and what have you, and, uh, and uh, can be a source of frustration, uh, is also recognized as a trendsetter in helping to shape uh, new paradigms and approaches to healthcare. Finally, 
another really important point to make about Medicaid is that many state Medicaid systems are under fiscal stress and have limited capacity to meet demand. This perhaps is another of the most important takeaways that I would like you all to consider today. State Medicaid programs oftentimes are one of the largest general fund obligations that any state government will have. States have invested significantly in Medicaid. Medicaid not only benefits individuals and their families, but Medicaid helps to create the basic health infrastructure that all of us have an opportunity to access if we are um, accessing care uh, outside the, the, the installation, if you will. And so um, Medicaid is a major budgetary feature in the states, but all of us know from the respective states that we live in or have lived in is that state budgets are constrained and budgetary politics can be very, very, uh, very much a hot button topic. And uh, states oftentimes find it difficult to meet their Medicaid budget obligations, even with generous federal matches. So that's also important for us to remember is that uh, Medicaid resources are, are stressed and limited at the state level. Now, if you will, I like to think in terms of movies. I don't know about you all, but during the pandemic, I have been watching more and more Netflix and other movie streaming movies. And so I guess I'm in a movie state of mind right now, but imagine uh, I'm the, that we're watching a movie together and we've just gone from the wide screen, the wide, the wide angle shot, if you will. Now we're starting to focus a little bit more. So I'd like now to sort of turn, uh, go to another scene, if you will, or another act of, of the movie, if you will, and talk a little bit more about TRICARE in the Medicaid system. So for the first part of our conversation has been about some of the broad aspects of Medicaid. Let's now focus on TRICARE. But before I do that, just wanna make certain that we don't have any questions in the, in the chat pod about Medicaid in general. Rachel, are we seeing any? No questions yet, Chris. Okay, thank you so much. So let's talk about TRICARE in the Medicaid system. Well, many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, TRICARE and DHA now rely greatly on private sector care. Okay. Private sector care, you know, means that more and more military families, more and more folks, DOD folks who are covered by, by uh, TRICARE. And we know that, you know, the numbers are, you know, total numbers are about, what, 9.5, 9 9.6 million folks are, are, are attached to the TRICARE system in one way or the other is that TRICARE has been going through a transition, a transformation, relying greater, uh, more and more on private sector care, or as some of you uh, would, might phrase it as care outside the gates or outside the installation. And this transformation, uh, which you know, we're gonna be learning more about actually in the next few months as uh, the Military Family Learning Network hosts uh, some webinars through our caregiving team on TRICARE, we know that the system is in transformation. What follows is that if the system is increasingly relying upon uh, healthcare delivery outside of the gates, if you will, then um, that system, that private sector care system, uh, is the shape and form of that will influence the way military families receive healthcare. And so it's, an, it, it, it's simply a, an extension, if you will, that if Medicaid is shaping the larger healthcare arena, it is also shaping that arena of private sector care that military families will encounter. So again, as Medicaid shapes the larger healthcare delivery landscape, as TRICARE becomes more immersed, more connected with private sector care, we will see the influence of Medicaid on the way that we approach healthcare delivery and management in the United States. Specifically, this includes greater reliance on managed care organizations for healthcare delivery, and again, growing reliance on home and community-based services for long-term care. One of the things that I have noticed looking at Medicaid and the military health system over the last 10 years or so is this interdependence, this relationship that has grown over time. And I would argue that these relationships are only getting stronger or the demand for these relationships to be stronger is only increasing. Here's 
here are a couple of interesting statistics for folks to keep in mind. In 2018, there was an estimated 867,000 individuals covered primarily through TRICARE who were also duly eligible for Medicaid. It's a fairly large number, 867,000. And of these, approximately 220,000 were children. Now, these facts and figures are from the Medicaid and CHIP Payment Access Commission, which is a federal entity. And you can see the site there, and we also have a link at the end of the PowerPoint slide. Makes for very interesting reading, and I would encourage you to take a look. The reason why this connection exists is that Medicaid may cover services not provided under the TRICARE benefit, including types of long-term care and supports for those with special needs. And so we find that some of the dual eligible population, if you will, for TRICARE and Medicaid is relying upon Medicaid for wraparound coverage for long-term care supports and services that might not be provided under the TRICARE benefit. Now, the reality is, is that TRICARE and Medicaid systems do not always communicate well with each other. Why might this be the case? Well, one big reason is that, remember, we have basically 50 Medicaid systems, plus those of the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico in the United States. And so we have over 50 different Medicaid systems in the United States, if we count for our states, the District of Columbia, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. With that said, it means that each of these um, jurisdictions have their own policies. Imagine how difficult it might be to coordinate between Medicaid and TRICARE if it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between one federal agency and another, which is probably difficult enough in itself, but you have 50 different systems. And then within these 50 plus systems, you have managed care organizations and others that really have the day-to-day -day responsibility for the management of Medicaid and increasingly TRICARE, as many of you know. And so the systems do not always communicate well with each other. And this has been a concern raised at the federal level. And there is an interest, there has been sustained interest in how the two systems can better talk to each other, communicate with each other to make certain that families who are duly eligible are getting the benefits and services that they need. So I would say that one policy dimension to all of this is for us to keep in mind that Medicaid is not generic, it's varied. It's varied because each state has a lot of discretion in the operation of the program. TRICARE is more uniform as we know, even if it is divided down with, 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 with managed care uh, contractors and, and coordinators at the national level in, in two different regions, it's a much more co coherent system, if you will. And so it's difficult at times for both of these systems to talk but they need to talk and they need to communicate in order to better coordinate care and also to make certain basically that the appropriate uh, insurers are paying the bills, if you will. And again, um, because of the fact that both Medicaid and uh, TRICARE increasingly rely upon managed care organizations, that just adds another level of complexity to all of this. This, this, uh, this slide just sort of reinforces what I just said, that TRICARE provides standard benefits and delivery models in general. Uh, it's certainly in comparison to Medicaid programs, which vary considerably across the, the states, not only in terms of the benefits that are offered and the service models that we utilize, but also in terms of eligibility criteria to participate in programs, okay? Um, and again, uh, in, in, in the MedCap report that I just, uh, mentioned, uh, the commission report that I just mentioned says that various regulatory issues and the decentralized nature of Medicaid uh, help to, to create some friction and there is a need for improvement in communication between uh, basically uh, states in the TRICARE system and by extension most likely from the, uh, from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services at the federal level and the TRICARE system. This is a quick aside. Um, we're not talking about Veterans Health Administration today, but I thought that this would be an important 
um, contextual slide to provide to you. Because I know that those of, those of you who work with military families, you're also very focused, of course, on the well-being of military families once they leave service and become veterans. And so this statistic also gives us another sense of just how important Medicaid is to those who also receive services through the Veterans Health Administration. And so again, these figures are from 2018, and they show that an estimated 960,000 Medicaid beneficiaries also receive services through the Veterans Health Administration. So again, I think we can all agree that there's a great deal of interconnection between these programs and that um, healthcare, when it comes to Medicaid and the military community is not siloed between the two. There's a great deal of interaction. There's a great deal of overlap and there are there oftentimes is a need for this dual eligibility status. So just given a quick overview on some of the relationships between TRICARE or the military health system and Medicaid. And so again, we're gonna change scenes, if you will, on this movie or this journey that we're taking today. And we're gonna talk about Medicaid expansion. But before I do so, I just wanted to ask if there are any questions out there. It's like things are moving along. Okay, great. So let's shift gears, if you will. I just changed metaphors, but I think that's okay on a Wednesday morning. Um, let's talk about Medicaid expansion. You know, in 2010, really landmark legislation was passed at the national level. We all know it is the Afford Care Act or the ACA. And the ACA had many provisions. And goodness, we could have webinar after webinar on the Affordable Care Act and the reforms and changes that it's made in our healthcare system. For myself, I would argue that one of the most um, fundamental changes that the Affordable Care Act provided for the states and for our country was the allowance that states could expand Medicaid eligibility to new groups of individuals, mainly adults with or without dependents, making up to about 138% of the federal poverty level. So the story of Medicaid expansion really is the main theme, it's the main narrative, if you will, I would argue with the Affordable Care Act and what we've come now since the adoption of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act took a while for to be implemented and that was by design. And so around 2013 and 2014, states started to increasingly adopt provisions under the Affordable Care Act to expand their Medicaid programs. The incentives were many. One was that the federal match rate for expanded Medicaid was more generous than what the states had traditionally paid. The other was uh, the states recognized that um, covering folks who were previously uninsured made good business sense. It meant that it would be less uncompensated care. That same logic extended to many healthcare providers, especially hospitals, primary care clinics, and many um, healthcare providers who recognized that Medicaid would also help them uh, have more sustainable healthcare operations that would help, if you will, with the fiscal bottom line of keeping things um, solvent. And so even though the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion has been controversial and a subject of political debate in many places and in many states, as of now, approximately 39 states, including the District of Columbia, have expanded Medicaid through provisions under the Affordable Care Act. So that means that 39 states or you know, a vast majority of our states have now expanded Medicaid, but many have not, many have not. But there are those states that are still considering it as expansion. So right now we have an interesting circumstance in the United States where we have a number of states that have opted not to expand Medicaid. And some of these states that have not expanded Medicaid include uh, those states where there are large populations of active duty military active duty military personnel and their families. Uh, and these include Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and Texas. So let me give you an illustration here. 
Take a look at this. This is a chart and it's adapted from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which we also have noted in the uh, reference section and which is also a really great resource if you're interested in what's happening in your state in terms of healthcare uh, status, uh, insurance, you name it. A really, really important source. A lot of folks use this source, the Kaiser Family Foundation. I highly recommend it. But let's just take a look at some enrollment track figures. If we look at the United States as a whole, in 2019, this is the most recent data we were able to get, um, Medicare covered about 14% of the population. Medicaid, remember what I said earlier on this, this morning, Medicaid covered 20% of the population. And the uninsured rate in our country was about 9%. And military, which also includes veterans uh, care, um, about 1% of the population, okay, as a whole. Now, we start to go and we look at some of the states. And, and what we did, and I worked with my uh, graduate assistant, Lucas Blankenship, to help me, and I appreciate his assistance. We took a look at some of the states that have the highest military populations. And we just put, a, put together this table based on the Kaiser Family Foundation information. And what we did is we identified some of the states, and, and I'm just looking at our chat pod right here and seeing that many of you are from these states. We looked at California, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, Virginia, and Washington state. And we wanted to take a look at some of these trends in terms of Medicaid. And you'll see that uh, California, Washington state, and fairly recently, the state of Virginia have expanded their Medicaid programs, meaning that, again, just to bring us back, that uh, Medicaid expansion means that adults up to 138% of the, popu uh, the federal poverty level with or without dependents uh, can be eligible for Medicaid. And what we've seen is that, uh, well, you can, this, the, the numbers kind of tell a story, right? So in, in California, 26% of the population now is served by Medicaid because California opted to expand Medicaid. Washington state, look at that, another expansion state, 20%. Virginia is at 14%, but I would argue that's a lag because Virginia um, expanded Medicaid just in the last couple of years or so. But if we look at the, the levels for Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, you can see that they're lower. Now, again, you know, those of you who are in our audience today, many of you work with military families. Many of you have an essential role in helping to connect folks to resources, to provide information. Others who might be joining with us today uh, work with military families, maybe not quite as directly. Maybe you're in the extension service, and maybe you're in a community-based organization that works with military families and others. And some of you may be folks who uh, have, a, have a, an immediate interest in Medicaid because of the need for access and care. Having this type of information can be very helpful to us because it gives us a sense of the landscape. It gives us a sense of the context. So here we are just looking at a number of states that have relatively high military family populations. And many of us know that those, those the same states oftentimes have what? high veterans populations, because people go to Virginia, Washington State, Florida, you name it, they're like, hmm, I'd like to retire here as well, or separate and, 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 and continue my career in, in, in the civilian side of things in this state. So understanding this landscape is very important for us, uh, because it helps us to, to understand some of the trends. And it is noticeable, you know, a big takeaway that I would that I would provide to everyone is that in, in states that have high military populations is that uh, a number of the states have not expanded Medicaid. So let's talk a little bit more about Medicaid and its importance. Medicaid provides long-term care and support services in terms of wraparound coverage. Medicaid long-term care and support services may be especially important for military families. It's, this is especially with the case with home and community-based services as it often augments care for families, including those in the military who are receiving the TRICARE benefit. Uh, these long-term care and support services serve all segments of the population, but they may be especially important for children with special health needs and for older adults, okay? A number of you have probably heard the phrase 
Home and Community-Based Services, or HCBS, waivers. And these and related programs are allowed under certain federal regulations in the Medicaid program. The bottom line is this, you know, the federal government and the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and um, our elected leaders, both Republican and Democrat, have recognized that Medicaid can be a platform for innovation and trying out new ideas. And so under the Medicaid program, there are special waiver provisions that have been established that allow states to apply to the federal government to get permission to operate new and distinct programs, which they would not traditionally utilize. And so one of these have been home and community-based services with the idea that it might be more effective, it might be more equitable, it might be more economical to provide services for families in the home or in a community-based setting rather than an institutional setting. So almost all the states, I think the numbers were somewhere in the neighborhood about 44 or 45 states, have what are called home and community-based services waivers to provide care like adaptive technologies, like in-home care uh, therapies for individuals in a home or community-based setting. So states apply to the federal government, they get permission to operate waiver programs, but they also have limits to what they can do. States have to operate within an established number of waiver positions or what are called slots for eligible participants. And unfortunately, what happens in many states is that those who would like to have the home and community-based services, say for in-home healthcare, adaptive technology or uh, adaptation of the physical uh, setting of a house, um, you know, like with, with, with uh, lifts and things like that, um, that the demand for these services oftentimes outstrips the availability, availability of these services. And part of this is a restriction that is regulatory that's placed upon the states. One of the things that some of you may be familiar with is that active duty military families moving between states through the PCS process may face special challenges in accessing these services because states may or may not have the waiver options that one had, say, in California if they moved to Texas or I'm just using those as hypotheticals. But the thing to understand is that with each state operating its own waiver system, there's not a sense of consistency across the country and eligibility determination process, the demand for these services is very intense. And so one of the challenges and difficulties that we see for the general population, as well as for the military population is accessing these waivered services. Let's talk about some of the common waiver services that exist. Common HCBS waiver programs include those with, for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And sometimes these programs are divided between programs aimed at children and those aimed at adults. Um, most states have intellectual and developmental disability waivers, but not all. The same can be true, can be said of the age and disabled waiver. A number of states have started to adopt what's called a traumatic brain injury waiver. And still other states have adopted serious mental illness or a serious emotional disorder okay. waiver or the SMI SED waiver. Now, again, a really useful resource that I would encourage folks to take a look at are, this, are the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services state profiles. And we have the we have the link right there. So if you're in Georgia, if you're in Kentucky, if you're in Nebraska, you can take a look at that, look up the state and see what waivers are available for families to apply for. There are some other waiver challenges too. So the, so the demand for waivered services is high. Waivers allow for home and community-based services based upon age, medical condition, and also geographic location in a state. Demand is high. Each state has its own approach to how it operates its waiver programs and the services that are provided. So even if two states have an, 
have, I'm going to go back on the slide here for just a moment. Let's just say that two states have intellectual development disabilities waivers, okay? It doesn't mean that those waivers are going to look the same. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same services or benefits provided. And it also mean, it, and it doesn't mean that the eligibility criteria will be the same, okay? And so there is a lot of variance going on here, which creates some challenges for folks if they're moving from state to state. But the pandemic has also created a few new challenges as well. Um, it's, it's created some new wrinkles in HCBS and related service delivery. One thing, and, we're, and we've seen this across the United States, right? In many different areas, there are staffing shortages, there are labor shortages in terms of available, uh, available and trained uh, professionals who can provide HCBS services. And so right now, home and community-based service programs are facing a labor shortage. At the same time, because of the pandemic and because of the, of the interest in, in isolating, right? Uh, and social distancing, there's been an increased demand for non-institutional care. So there's even more intense pressure on the HCBS system than there was, I would say, two years or so ago. The federal government has identified this, and in fact, in the American Recovery Act, has provided some funds and, and incentives for the states to try to address these challenges. But these are short-term commitments right now. Um, Again, I just want to reiterate that another challenge in waivers is that ideally Medicaid waiver programs should supplement and coordinate with TRICARE and other options like Medicare. But government analysis suggests that the systems don't always coordinate well. And we reviewed that just a few minutes ago. We were talking about the potential sources of friction between TRICARE and Medicaid systems just, just working together. So it's about 11.47, so we got about 12 or 13 minutes left. Of course, I need to give Rachel some time to, rate, to, to wrap things up. But I want to talk about a couple of things that are happening with Medicaid that, that I think are uh, sort of uh, are a, uh, shaping the future, if you will. First, one big takeaway from today's presentation is that Medicaid has always been a work in progress, has been a platform for innovation and development. A lot of the approaches to healthcare that we take for granted today were pioneered by Medicaid. And sometimes it just wasn't Medicaid, but Medicaid was a big player, if you will, had a, had a prominent role in the stage. And whether it's managed care, whether it's early childhood care, whether it's school-based care, uh, whether it's something very relevant to all of us, home and community-based care, where our loved ones can have care in their homes and support in their homes, Medicaid has been a pioneer with this. So, we would not expect, I mean, we would, we, we would be mistaken to think that, that Medicaid innovation has changed, right? So Medicaid has continued to be utilized as a platform and uh, for innovation and experimentation. And so there's a couple uh, of, of developments that I would like to share with you as we sort of wrap things up today. One big trend is that Medicaid is embracing a more holistic approach to healthcare delivery. A lot of the priorities of Medicaid would uh, reflect what are called the social determinants of health. Not only being in a position to treat disease or to treat, to treat healthcare conditions, but to understand uh, the sources of disease and healthcare conditions and how life circumstances can contribute to this. And so one of the things that Medicaid is giving further emphasis to is what's called the social determinants of health. Another big trend includes again uh, the uh, is again is uh, refining and uh, expanding modes of delivery. And I would say that one of the modes of delivery we should keep in mind is the utilization of telemedicine and telehealth. The pandemic created emergency situations where the federal government gave the states authority to utilize telehealth to reach uh, Medicaid beneficiaries. As a result. Um, a lot of folks were able to be, continue to be connected to the healthcare system even during the worst months and days of the pandemic. Now, perhaps, we hope that we're coming out of the pandemic. Folks might start to look at Medicaid and telemedicine and consider making these arrangements more permanent and expanding their adoption to other areas of healthcare covered by other healthcare payers. So 
let's just mention this very quickly, uh, the social determinants of health and well-being. Again, I want you to think about this as, as you tune in today from your various places. We know that a family's well-being, we know that a family's health is contingent on many factors. And some of these factors are, are the context and environment in which we live. Uh, do the families have adequate economic resources uh, for heat, for food, for food security? How about the physical and built environment? Are homes safe? Are they, are they environmentally safe? Are there environmental hazards? How about educational status and attainment? Educational status and attainment oftentimes is a pathway. Uh, to career and jobs. One of the great promising things of, 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 of work in the military sector, right? Being a career in the military are all the opportunities for training and education that are provided to families and to service members. Basic needs like food and nutrition, not only access to food, but eating the right things, right? Food security, very important to the social determinants of health. Social and community capacity, context and networks. Is it easy to get to a physician? Is it easy to get to a healthcare provider? Does one have a car to get there or reliable public transportation? What about those around you? Are they encouraging you to live a healthy lifestyle? Are they giving you the needed information that is required to, to access healthcare, especially preventative healthcare, right? Not just going to the physician or to a healthcare provider when you're sick, but also for wellness and prevention and checkups. And obviously healthcare access coverage and services. You know, I often tell my students that healthcare coverage does not necessarily equate with healthcare access, right? You may have insurance, but you may not have the means of accessing the healthcare. And TRICARE and Medicaid are giving this issue of access even greater emphasis. And so, uh, Rachel, if you don't mind, if you could share with folks um, uh, in the chat pod, um, the, the link to a Medicaid uh, initiative that is now just being uh, launched. And it's the Medicaid Access Initiative. And they're actually looking for public comment and ideas on some of the issues uh, that are tied into the social determinants of health of how to get families better connected to healthcare through Medicaid. And so again, you know, a big part of the trainings and, and webinars that we do is to help you all access new resources. And so I would encourage you to take a look at this and see what the, Medic Med what the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the federal government is emphasizing right now. It's a brand new initiative that's just been launched, building on some efforts in the past. So what does the future hold? Well, again, I just wanna reiterate, please keep an eye out for telehealth. I think it's become more widely adopted and accepted under Medicaid, as well as under other programs such as Medicare and other insurance providers. The Home and Community-Based Services System, HCBS. Again, think of how many families in the military and outside of the military, young and old, benefit from home and community-based services. A healthcare provider or a professional who can come to the home can help with care, can help with adaptive technologies, can help with therapy and services, can help with nutrition, you name it. As the home and community-based service approach evolves, so too will some of the new case management approaches. One of the things that we're seeing increasingly are, are the reliance upon managed care to help coordinate HCBS. But at the same time, we're also seeing that the federal government has given greater focus on empowering families themselves to make health care choices in terms of home and community-based service care, including the direct employment of health care, um, I, I should say, of those who can provide the assistance in, in home and community-based services. One of the things that we're seeing, and, and, and Andy Crocker and I talked about this in a, in, a, in a webinar a number of months ago, is that we might see that there might be changes in terms of licensure as things increasingly go to telehealth and the experiences of the pandemic are digested, we may see Medicaid services being provided from outside of a state, which creates new complicating factors if, if, if a state has an agreement or has a recognition of licensure across state lines for Medicaid reimbursement. The last longer term implications. 
Even though Medicaid can be a platform for innovation and expanding healthcare access, it is severely stressed economically. And so states may have to do more with less. Increased demand for Medicaid services will have to be with limited and stressed fiscal resources due to the economy and other trade-offs that we have in budget priorities. Remember that states have the ability to adjust and adapt. They've done so through the recent pandemic and will continue to do this. And those of you who are interested in digging deeper, this is also called state plan amendments where the Medicaid program changes uh, with the permission of the federal government, certain provisions to what are called state plan amendments. Increased demands on the healthcare system may lead to administrative delays. You know, one of the one of the challenges for home and community-based service waiver programs is that because the demand outweighs the supply, that people oftentimes have to wait months, if not years, to, to, be, to, to be covered through these programs. As we've talked about, coverage is not necessarily access. So again, part of our jobs in helping families access healthcare is thinking about the barriers that might exist and trying to address those barriers. We are coming out of the pandemic, we hope, fingers crossed. And because of that, some of the special provisions that have been provided by the federal government for more flexibility in the operation of the Medicaid programs may also be coming to an end. Definitely some of the financial uh, supports that have been provided under federal law are limited in time. Some of these will be closing out in December of 2022, unless they are reauthorized. Just a quick summary, Medicaid, military families. Families with special needs may utilize Medicaid waiver services that provide home and community-based services. Again, think about the wraparound aspect. Think about the 200,000 plus kids in the military families who utilize uh, Medicaid. Think about the 800,000 plus of the total Medicaid, of the total military population uh, that's with a TRICARE that is utilizing Medicaid. So very important wraparound component, a very important resource for many, many families in the military context. Also remember that non-dependent family members such as older parents and relatives may qualify. And so when you're working with families, they may have questions about their parents. They may have questions about other family members who are not part of the dependent unit, if you will, but uh, certainly are of concern to, to that service member, his or her family. Medicaid supports local healthcare infrastructure, especially hospitals and primary care clinics. I cannot emphasize this enough, that Medicaid has helped to create the infrastructure of healthcare in our states, some states more so than others. Also, because Medicaid is distinct to each of the, uh, each of the states, it may create challenges for families moving from state to state due to varying practices and services. This is just the conclusion web page. I'm sorry, the conclusion PowerPoint slide. And again, just reiterating what I've said. And I'll leave it there with you all to again highlight the fact that Medicaid is such an important part of our landscape and such a very, very important part of the work that you all do with military families. And so with that, I'll conclude and I'll turn things back to Rachel Browner. Rachel? Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. As we close out, I wanted to um, go ahead and pop in the chat for everyone's knowledge. You know, this this session um, this month was focusing on Medicaid services. We're we're doing a healthcare series throughout 2022 for our military caregiving group. Um, and just last month, we did a session on Medicare. So if you are interested in Medicare, Medicaid, get connected with us. Um, this recording will be posted in a couple of days to the event page. So if you have folks that are still interested and want to um, view the recording, receive CE credit, please do so. Also, I popped in the chat a link to our Medicare session um, on Medicare changes in 2022, which was last month. You can still watch that recording as well, receive CE credits. Um, but as we close out, if Coral, you could go to the next slide for me. This particular session is providing um, CE credit for social workers, case managers, patient advocates, 
certified family life educators, as well as a certificate of attendance. And so if you are interested in receiving CE credit or a certificate of attendance for joining us, please go to today's event page. Um, and there's going to be a link that you'll be able to click on. Um, as a reminder, I will post um, today's session link in the chat box for you to get. Um, but go ahead and click on that continue education um, purple button and you open um, today's event page to receive CE credit. It's automatically generated certificate. So if you have any issues um, or questions receiving your certificate, my email address is listed on the PowerPoint slides, rbrowner at ag.tamu.edu. Please send me an email and I will um, be happy to help you get that certificate that you're looking for as well. Um, join us next month. We are honoring and highlighting month um, TBI Awareness Month, which is in March. And so we are doing a two-part series with our colleagues within family development. And um, the two-part series is going to be on brain health. Part one is going to be understanding military-related TBIs. So get connected with us. That's going to be on March 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That webinar um, is going to be with the Traumatic Brain Injury Centers of Excellence, and it's going to be examining VA and military health system TBI pathway of care, um, current DOD understandings of concussion and symptoms, um, and provide resources for management of a concussion. So that's going to be part one. Join us next month. Um, get signed up for our TBI Awareness Month series um, for that particular webinar. All right, so as we close out, just stay connected with our Military Families Learning Network. We're going to be on for maybe a couple of more minutes as you gather those last minute resources and links in the chat box. If you have any final questions for today's presenter, which we are so thankful, um, Dr. Christopher Pline for providing information on Medicaid. Thank you so much. Um, lots of information. But if you have any questions, we're going to hang on for a couple of more minutes. Um, so stay tuned and get connected with us for next month's resources. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great week, everyone.